So today's presentation will focus on the physical limits of natural resources extraction. What does it mean to us, Homo geologicus, to meet net zero? Your source of funding, at least CET's um, source of funding, seems to be mostly coming from gold and to a lesser extent coal companies. So let's have a look at what gold really is. Um, kind of is a, a needle in the haystack, as in it's need to be enriched about a thousand times to get to the ore, as ore and one part per million. And it's really getting its value from the derived, if for intensive nature, um, it's time consuming for low tech artisanal miners and um, it's resource and energy intensive for industrial miners too. And gold really is only worth chasing if your time is not worth much and if you don't have a better opportunity as an artisanal miner or if uh, resources and energy are cheap. Um, and so because energy is so cheap, it only makes around 2% of our budget. So because it's just a couple percent of our spendings, we allocate a tiny fraction of the time to that. And yet pretty much like your brain is 98%, uh, it's 2% of your mass. You're 100% dead without it. So try making 98% of the GDP. We had the 2% that the energy actually represents. So because the whole world is actually energy, isn't it? Let's dive into those thermodynamics 101. So energy is best defined as the ability to transform surroundings. Here are machines that lift, carry, excavate, drill, push, create, flatten, hold, tow. It's all about changing the original state of the system. Mechanic energy is used to locally increase kinetic energy and potential stored energy from height. Mining gold, like any other mining activity, is just about changing those shapes, those height and speed and carrying masses across space. And this involves energy. So energy really is there to quantify the change of state of a system. And energy is everywhere from a modification of pressure, temperature, shape, speed, chemical composition, atomic composition, entropy, enthalpy, energy, photons, position in the field, whether magnetic, electric or gravitational energy everywhere. And as long as your calculation uh, is homogeneous, you're good because energy is nothing else but a metric to perform accounting in the world we So saying that energy is a physical quantity means there are all the changes that it's gonna um, be governed by a law that just can't change. And so that's the interesting bit about physics is that um, you're gonna have a maximum yield. So that Carnot yield, for instance, only depends from the difference between the hot and cold temperature in your power plants, whether it's coal fired, nuclear fired, geothermal or gas fired doesn't really matter as long as you have different temperature uh, sources, these are gonna give you the maximal yield. And the first law of thermodynamics is gonna tell you that you can't create energy like Harry Potter, you're gonna have to find it in the environment and then use a converter to harness it. Um, so to say it differently, as energy becomes abandoned, mankind transform the world. And so the more the environment was changed, means the more access to energy we've had. So if we start discussing the material footprint, it refers to the total amount of raw materials extracted to meet final consumption demands. It is one indication of the pressures placed on the environment to support economic growth and to satisfy the material needs of people. The global material footprint rose up to 70% since 2000, more as what can be seen on this graph. So the rate of natural resources extraction has accelerated. And using the turn of the century as a reference, it's obvious that the global consumption of raw material increases faster than the GDP or the population. In other words, at the global level, there has been more, no decoupling of material footprint growth from either population growth or GDP growth. So it's imperative that we reverse this trend. So you may be familiar with this picture much better getting start, uh, started shoveling this all out. So even against 100 billion tons of material movement mankind does, the contribution of extraterrestrial mass increase. Oh, did I, I think I, um, yeah, I've, okay, anyway. Um, so on, on the former slide, basically, um, at the bottom of it, you had some jigsaw pattern. And so that shows you that mankind is uh, erosion factor 23 times more important than naturally 
er occurring erosion with sediments um, uh, reaching the uh, rivers and, uh, and the sea eventually. And so in terms of other mass balance that would be interesting to, to bring orders of magnitude together, even against those 100 billions of material movement that we actually do, the contribution of extraterrestrial mass increase of the Earth is negligible. Hence a very solid conclusion. We can consider our solar vessel as a finite quantity, a stock given once for all, a closed system. And we are, as a species, moving 62 million times more material than the meteorites uh, coming in. All right. So the production of iron, steel, cement, aluminium, non-ferrous material accounts for about 12% of the global energy consumption. That's a really nice chart from EAR. Um, and then you see the direct links between energy and the, um, the mining system. So I'd like you to think machines when you're actually thinking of energy, because the only primary energy human can consume is regular edible biomass, that's food. So you've got your toast with Vegemite, you're full of beans, and then can deliver a bit of fair work and heat. But if you want to have more impact on the world, you need to mobilize extra power, which requires extra energy sources and the associated converters. And using more energy translate directly to using more machinery because that's what we've seen in history. So what does that mean? Well, the average Australian is using 63,000 kilowatt hour per person and per year. Is that much? Well, if you consider an average human being, you can develop 100 watt of power with your legs, 10 watt with your arms, and about 100 kilowatt a year. So it's as if you had 630 slaves for the average Australian, but you're above average, following you and doing work for you so that, that microphone works and so um, is everything around us. So say Toto is in Africa, Madagascar in that um, sapphire mine. And so you've got cubes of gem bearing dirt and water that need to be removed from the pit. So what's the best option? Would you go full artisanal mining or would you get some assistance from fossil fuel? Mind you that Malagasy Schwarzenegger is on average salary there, that is 500 USD a year, and he can deliver 100 kilowatt of labor annually. So that's basically equals MGH there. So trivially, you conclude the price of the human powered kilowatt hour is 50 cents. Well, in Perth and Madagascar, the gasoline and diesel is about like I said, $2 a liter. So um, within that one liter of diesel, you've got 10 kilowatt hour of primary energy. And then if you put that into an engine to recover uh, mechanical work, which you can actually use, you're going to have those 20 to 40% yield. Remember Carnot before. Um, so that makes the price of um, that kilowatt hour uh, around like 40 cents. Um, and if you were to plug yourself to the grid, it would cost you 30 to 40 cents too. So on one hand, you've got that um, source of energy, which works 24-24, doesn't require rights or leave or anything really, um, and costs you 40 cents, 30 to 40 cents. And on the other hand, you've got a human being, which if you take uh, that Malagasy is like 50 cents, but if you were to take the average Australian bloke, would be closer to $50 plus. So what do you choose? Well, you choose fossil fuel, and that's why they're using a pump to dewater the pit rather than carrying buckets. It's cheaper. So why are they with spades moving the dirt out? It's just because there's a local law that helps them having jobs because fossil food will actually be cheaper. And so the other conclusion of that is, why did we set up slavery? Because your slave is going to cost you $500 a year, give or take, you know, food capturing and stuff. So the reason is not because we've become good or we care about ethics. It's just because it's cheaper to run on fossil fuel. So oil and gas really are making our job much more efficient, very moral, but unsustainable. So the Alcoa Alimine plant, for instance, uses 90 megawatts of electricity. That's four times the population of Western Australia that would be required to, to hammer those aluminium sheets down. So this presentation will be recorded, and if you want to browse through the energy requirements of every single entry here, essential for mining, uh, you're welcome to do that on YouTube. So we have been building 
an ever more complex, more powerful exoskeleton so that our desire to dominate and curb nature would be met. Progress has enabled the bipeds that we are to effectively multiply our power in nature by numerous orders of magnitude. The operator of the dozer, you can see, clears the bush at the pace of an army of 68,000 people by sitting in the cabin with cooling air con. And to some degree, it doesn't even matter if the engine is fueled by coal, diesel, gas, electric, battery, or worse idea, hydrogen, because the end result is the same. You can clear the entire bush or rainforest or state forest with a dozer running on green, brown, black, blue energy. You have become iron mind with extension of your body taking different shapes, and we just don't realize. And here in Australia, the picture is no different than the global average. 82%, 84% for Australia of all primary energy consumption is coming from fossils. And what you hear about is the renewables that are making the top person here. When realistically, we should discuss 82% of the fossils. And if the target is to be 100% renewable by 2050, I think we are fused to be short of a six pack. So there's a version of the mean value theorem that states, among others, that infinite growth in a finite world can't happen. Even if you're an economist or a politician, the maths go against that. So if you were to have a yearly extraction or stock depletion um, remaining constant, the area below this curve wouldn't be finite, wouldn't be um, limited, and so you'd have infinite stock. But we've seen that the mass of the Earth is a constant-ish. So basically, the area below the curve, regardless of the shape of the curve, has to remain constant. And things are, we have already passed the peak. So you can tell yourself the hilarious joke about long-term sustainable green growth. There is no such the finite planet. So the first, uh, for the first time in 2018, the International Energy Agency confirmed that the global conventional crude oil production had peaked in 2008. And is this linked to the global financial crisis? That you think you know? No. Um, in the 2021 version of the World Energy Outlook, oil projection uh, production shows for the first time an eventual decline in all scenarios. In the 2022 World Energy Outlook, that becomes the first scenario to show global demand for each of the fossil fuel, oil, gas, and coal exhibit a peak or a plateau. So peak uh, for coal um, is in the next few years. Natural gas demand reaches a plateau by the end of the decade, and oil demand reaches a high point in the mid-2030s before falling. The result is the total demand for fossil fuel declines steadily from the mid 2020s by around two exajoules or about one million barrel of oil equivalent on average. So when there is no COVID around, what is the first limiting factor to the economy? Well, actually it's in the ground and you see those two graphs are correlated, but one is um, dropping before the other. First, you've got the drop in the oil, demand, consumption or production, and then you've got that drop in capita. That's the, um, the reason for so there is some good contribution from oil and gas. Um, they save the waves. Um, and this is an illustration from Vanity Fair in 1861 um, with substitution of goods. So um, these are a few extracts from a, a nice ebook I would advise you to read. Um, so the thing with oil and gas prospecting, it's pretty much like Easter egg hunting. You find the biggest, least well-hidden ones first, and then you're going to have to go for the deep water oil, shale oil, oil sands, fracking. So We'll always try to extract more oil, regardless of the cost, because oil is the medium of exchanges among machines, and that's what feeds them. How are we going to get your mangoes and banana from Carnarvon with our trucks? Our logistics supply chain is reliant on these fossil and finite resources. A third of the fleet of trucks is dedicated to transporting edible products at one point of their transformation journey. How will W get fed? Our whole economy relies on transportation, and trucking your gold ore to the rum seems quite secondary if you can't have your primary needs of food met. So the hallmark of oil scarcity isn't price, but rather the amount of investment required to extract it. In 2004, 
Big Oil invests in 70 billion to extract 17 billion barrels a year. And then 10 years later, um, something quite more significant, 300 billion uh, yields less oil. So this, more than price, is um, the marker of the decline and so is the energy return on energy invested. Um, so economists have um, created that theoretical graph that is really nice, showing the relationship between uh, quantity and price, and that's what we call uh, elasticity. And typically, textbook shows, well, sometimes it does work if you have a look at the price uh, volume relationship of, uh, of W and diamonds, it's such a nice textbook concave curve as if there was a diamond cartel controlling the invisible hand of the market. When it comes to oil and gas, it looks like more like an erratic trajectory of a balloon. Increase of quantity, stable price, increase in price, stable quantity, decrease in price, stable quantity. It, nothing predictable around here. And merry-go-round keeps on going with the USA example here until the head of state wants it. Until the head of state wants it to pop. I hope this dynamic graph helps deflate the idea that prices I call a straightforward signal of the future availability of a resource. Um, and here in gold, W example, high price, uh, no, high quantity, low uh, high price, low quantity, higher price, increased quantity, higher price. There is not a single straightforward relationship. A good signal for quantity. Um, and the question: Do we actually ever learn? The coal consumption two years ago rose by 6%. That's 6.4 billion tons of coal a year on top. And then if you put that in comparison with that note from a Kiwi newspaper that said 110 years ago that CO2 is making the air a more effective blanket for the earth and is set to raise the temperature with considerable effects in a few centuries, so pretty much like quartz, corundum, spinel, magnetite, rutile, cassiterite, CO2 has a very strong oxygen bond, which makes it resistant to chemical attacks. That's why you find these in heavy sense. And so carbon dioxide is an oxide very hard to break apart. And it's a shame that social media prefer the coverage of billionaires' big dick energy in space battle or reporting on the East Coast of West Coast and the AFL rather than disclosing those IPCC reports in the media because there is good on that. So this is um, a graph. So there were 284 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere at the time Perth was founded in 1829. And it's only gone up since 400 ppm today. So you'll find this is a very robust trend with numerous data points throughout the globe. Thanks to Mr. Keeling, who started recording in 1958 in Hawaii, the red dot here on the graph, and NOAA and CSRO and the other organization for keeping collecting and presenting that data. So carbon is continuously exchanged among the reservoirs through natural processes. They occur at their various rates, ranging from daily to seasonal fluctuation and to very long-term cycles, which occur over hundreds of millions of years. For example, this is a clear seasonal cycle in atmospheric CO2 as plant photosynthesized during the growing season, removing large amount of CO2. Respiration and decomposition of leaves and organic matter release CO2 back in the atmosphere. On the scale spanning decades to centuries, CO2 levels fluctuate gradually between the ocean and atmospheric reservoirs. There is a partial pressure equilibrium between the air and the surface of the water and the water in contact with the atmosphere, which means that should the CO2 concentration start decreasing in the atmosphere, the sink that was the ocean will re-equilibrate by releasing the excess CO2 that was originally dissolved. Due to the large surface area of the ocean and the high solubility of carbon dioxide in water, the ocean stores very large amount of carbon, about 50 times more than it is in the atmosphere or terrestrial um, biosphere. Much longer cycles also occur on the scale of geologic times due to the deposition and weathering of silicates and carbonate rocks. To determine if a phenomenon is part of statistical noise or significance, it's always a good idea to have a look at the longest data set available. This way, you grasp the scale of a given variation. And here, that graph is worth a thousand words. The last time the planet was at 420 ppm today, was when Homo habilis was leaving Africa 
2.5 million years ago. And remember, you're allowed to cry. All right, so nice all about burning now and paying later. So this is a graph from the fifth IPCC report showing the response to an idealized instantaneous CO2 pulse in the atmosphere. It takes 100 years for plants to remove 60% of the injected CO2. So um, basically, we are pretty lucky that the agency, when they built the pyramids, didn't use fossil fuel because otherwise we'd still have 15% of their CO2 today. That's what it means. And that's the biggest problem because by the time we only have like 50% of the CO2 left or even like 20%, I'm dead, you're dead, any government is history, and there's no big incentive into acting for the longer term because we are very short-sighted. So here is a graph from that IPCC report. And don't be surprised if you don't see the contribution of carbon aceous chondrites on the overall energy budget because it's pretty negligible. So from 1750 to 1850, there is a much impact on the radiative forcing that is the difference between the energy that reaches the Earth and that that is radiated away. It changes when we start emitting infrared uh, absorbing GHG gases. While the fine particles of aerosols have a cooling effect, it's not enough to contract the extra blanket provided by the other greenhouse gases. Even the minute particles generated in a volcanic eruption aren't enough and would just mask the signal, the entropic signal for like three years and then you're back on the trend. Um, and so as a civilization, we've added an extra 2.8 watt per square meter of radiative. The fact that temperature and relative intimity best predict times when climatic conditions become deadly is consistent with human thermal physiology. So here you've got a map where that's the number of days in the year where the temperature is higher than 35 degree, your skin temperature, and there is 100% moisture in the air. So you can't thermoregulate. So if you're a warm blooded animal, you die. So this is the map of Europe. Um, there wouldn't have been any Brexit uh, 18,000 years ago at the maximum of the ice age because the ocean was 100 meter, 120 meters lower. So um, you could cross basically the channel there was three kilometers ice uh, thick on the, um, in uh, northern Europe, and all of that uh, water had to come from somewhere, and um, that's why the, um, the outline looks a bit different. The difference between this and today, that's five degrees, and it took just under like 20,000 years to happen. We are on track to get this temperature variance in 150 years. Is that going to happen? at a nice pace. So basically, you can tell your kids now that the inertia of the system is such, the current climate you lived in is now lost forever. Where are you on this graph? So estimates of the future CO2, budget, uh, CO2 emissions from existing fossil fuel infrastructure with that additional abatement already exceeds the remaining carbon budget for limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. So basically, 1.5 degree is done and we're gonna get it by 2030. Um, and given all of the coal mines and oil and gas projects uh, that are about to be signed, um, there is high chances, 83% chances that the two degrees target is gonna get. So this graph says that you're emitting 16 tons of CO2 on average a year, and you are just here in the US. Do you? Well, this is a Sankey diagram that has been um, created by the Shift project in France, and it's a pretty nice thing that shows you that it's a bit more complex than that. There are multiple ways of assessing the carbon impacts uh, per uh, habitant. So you can either have the production-based method, where you look at the country the contribution. You can have a look at the consumption-based method, where you have a look at the imported emissions. Or you can uh, have a look at the endogenized capital. Regardless of that, you have a carbon budget, which is yeah, between 20 and 27 tons of uh, CO2. That's a lot, given that the target is two. All right. So the intent of this figure is to show the proportionality between cumulative CO2 emissions and global surface air temperature 
in observation in models. So basically, if you read here, you can tell, okay, I want two degrees, how much budget do I have? And then you know how much uh, more CO2 you're left to emit. So past emissions to date, 23,390 uh, 2, gigatons of CO2. That's assuming 2000, no, 2019. So if you want 1.5 degrees elevation, that's another 500,000 uh, tons, 500 gigatons, sorry, you've got left. If you want a 67% chance of remaining below the two degree target, you've got 1150 uh, gigatons of CO2. So for every 1,000 gigaton of CO2 emitted by human activity, um, the global surface temperature rises by 0 0.45. So if you want to be on track for that uh, scenario by 2050, it means dividing those emissions by three. What does that mean? Well, I guess you're familiar with compounded interest. So let's apply this. You've got 28 years till 2050. You want to have a third of the current carbon. So that's basically a 4% decrease per annum. Maths. Now, say you want to have a look at the closer target, 2030. So instead of waiting and overshooting, you want to be a bit proactive and you want most of the effort to be taking place now because that's when it's the easiest. Well, you need a 43% reduction. Okay. So let's have a look again, 5% decrease a year. Same ballpark, a bit, a bit more work. But what happened in 2020? COVID, minus 6%. So one year of COVID with the associated lockdowns, that's being on track. What happened in 2021? plus 6%. So you cancel out the effect of COVID. So you just lost two years and 2022 plus 0.1%. So now, instead of 0.43, you want 0.44, and then you only have seven years left by 2030, which means that basically you've doubled your year on year decrease. So now it's two COVID a year you actually need to be on track at a global scale. So let's start with the um, tautology. That is, CO2 emissions are strictly equals to themselves. So for added fun, let's multiply the right member of the equation by one, or actually let's multiply and divide by another term, total energy supply. So now we've got a ratio of CO2 over energy, which refers to the quantity of CO2 emitted per unit of energy or transformation of the world, remember. So remember that energy is that physical modification of your surroundings. So this term is hosting all of the debate on decarbonization, ditching out the fossil fuel, replacing them with nuclear, hydro, solar, wind, biomass. So the next step involves multiplying and dividing by the GDP. This new term is expressing energy per unit of GDP. So basically how much transformation of the world is required to get one additional unit of added value. It's easier to gulp a beer from a glass bottle than raw sand or from aluminium can rather than unrefined bauxite. So should you multiply and divide once more, you can introduce the effect of population. The GDP per capita is the ratio of the country's or the world's domestic product per inhabitant and characterize how rich you are. But you can also see this as the amount of services available to the population. If the CO2, the CO2 emissions are a linear function of the size of the population, all other things being equal, it's just the more, the merrier. The more earthlings, the greater the emissions. Conclusion number two, CO2 emissions are proportional to the production per capita. Hence the question, can society have infinitely growing goods and services, ever increasing purchasing power while CO2 emissions drop? Decoupling happens if the other terms of the equation balance out and drop quicker. Big question if you ask me. Conclusion number three, reducing CO2 emissions is proportional to our efforts in driving down the energy requirements of our productive economy. These terms improves if you are using less kilowatt hour to mine the same amount of gold ounces, for instance. This one is technologically driven, unlike the others. 
And at last, we discuss the other one with the source of primary energy and the less carbon intensive alternatives. So back to option one. Let's follow Tano's advice on how to get all things perfectly balanced, including these equations. So you die, you die, you live, you die, you die, you live, and then you end up with a third. So not very ethical, we've tried, and um, basically not even war, not even diseases are quick enough into bringing the population down. And actually, the UN says that with 1.1% growth per year, that's a very straight graph, uh, by 2050, we're up 29%. So maybe we shouldn't account. Option two, slash by three, how CO2 intensive energy is. Do we have the technology for that? Well, yes, for electricity generation, but electricity is just a fraction of the energy usage. We still haven't electrified many industry sectors like transport or in mining. And even when we install low carbon energy generation plants, we're just adding to the total energy supply. We're not replacing fossil based power plants. So the gain in efficiency in last uh, 50 years was 20%. So at the current rate, we'll take three centuries to reach net zero emissions. So that's not good enough. We're going to have to find. Um, this shows you that until 2008, that big uh, fat orange line shows that Australia has been doing nothing in terms of being uh, finding decreasing the energy, the CO2 content of energy, being CO2 efficient. Only recently, and that's a really nice map that shows that on average, Western Australia for the past 12 months has been having 414 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And that's the split first, burning coal, then burning gas, and only then you've got some solar. Option three, decreasing the reliance of GDP on energy. So the economists call that decoupling. Techno solutionists say it's going to happen. Government says it's possible. Well, I think it's an illusion. The only realistic economic growth that doesn't require energy is when inflation introduces value with no physical changes in the real world. Think about the capital gain tax, the stem duty on some land or property. No intrinsic re energy requirement for that, yet it delivers financial value. It drives speculative bubbles and it never lasts. If technological progress have reduced the energy requirement for the production of goods a bit, this is not the main driver of this graph. The answer lies in the recent growth of the service business and the rest of the tertiary sector is the dollars coming from realtors selling houses to miners themselves needing accountants educated by teachers, protected by insurers, audited by consultants, authorized by governmental bodies and so on, which um, and the whole system remains reliant on the underlying primary sector. And we'll see in the next slide how crucial energy is for that GDP in the industry. Based on the last 28 years, which is the time we've got by 2050, we can expect a reduction of 26% of the energy intensity of the economy. That's not enough to compensate for the population bomb. So this is the best macroeconomic representation of the world. What you see is a very, very straight line, slightly concave, uh, which shows that we are getting a bit more efficient to generate value, but obviously you can't see a straight decoupling by shooting increasing GDP without increasing the energy requirements or even decreasing it because nearly all the efficiency gains are lost in the rebound effects or the take back effects. If your car requires less fuel to travel the same distance, then you go further for the next holidays. You should have understood by now that energy is not just a cog in the wheel of our modern societies and economies, it's the wheel itself. Option four, we still need the right side of the equation to be balanced. And so far, we're only down 7% by 2050 instead of the target of down 67%. Is it realistic to get the production per person to bear the weight of a 60% drop? In the time elapsed in the last 28 years, which is the same as what's left by 2050, wealth by inhabitants have risen by 58%. That's how you actually afford to be around us with us, with tertiary education, having time to retire, having leisure time, not working during weekends. There were not that many spare mouths a century ago. 
So basically, if we want to drop 60% there, it's as if you had a 60% drop in your salary, or it's as if you were to return in the 60s. It's doable, people. But I guess the blessing that comfort has brought to our society, it's also a curse because purchasing power is a drug and politician keeps promoting affordability uh, for the materialistic apes that we are and that want to consume, but it can't fit within the planetary limits. Um, so decoupling isn't a piece of cake. Uh, one century of technological advancement, and so what? Any inflection of the curve, any visible decoupling at the macro scale, there you can quote any technological advancements, any political action, only COVID has had an impact on that graph. That's why it's the best macroeconomic representation of the world. Neither dematerialization, uh, the internal bubble, the first computer in the 50s, nothing has made this curve change. All right, a bit about the galactic limits to growth. So global primary energy demand increased by 5.8% in 2021. Understand that more GDP, hence more money to your pension fund at a pace that you will hope will remain constant until you retire. But let's be conservative. Let's assume 2% growth instead. So the maths are telling us that the 2% composite growth means doubling every 37 years. So whether you're on Earth or in a galaxy far, far away. So the energy reaching Earth is currently 7.5 thousand times more than what we mobilized. And then if you quote your techno solutionist like, or like Bezos or Musk, that says it's equivalent having the entire Nevada covered in solar panels. So basically in 37 years, we need another Nevada. And then another one. And 450 years later, you require the whole Earth to be covered in solar PV, so to meet our ever-growing energy requirements. And then the billionaires abstract themselves from the planetary limits and offer to colonize space and Mars. Well, that 2% planetary growth requires us to use the whole sun in 1,500 years. And then another 37 years later, we need another sun. And the closest one is Proxima Centauri, 4 billion light years away. So if you want to be there in time, you need to travel past the speed of light. Good luck. The critical minerals are a fundamental part of the energy and the electricity security landscape. Demand for critical minerals for clean energy technology is set to rise two to fourfold by 2030, depending on the scenario you're taking. And as a result of the expanding deployment of renewables, copper use sees the largest increase in terms of absolute volumes, with current demand around 6 million tons a year, increasing to 16 million tons a year in the net zero scenario. And just like cheap price can't guarantee future volumes, it happens that production has to stop because of climate related issues. But so just letting you know that the fair price of the ton of carbon would be around $100,000, according to some studies, said so the carbon price of $40, but I won't have time to. And the problem of the talk I'm doing is that I'm focusing on CO2, tunneling vision, uh, forgetting about ocean acidification. Um, the nitrogen, phosphorus cycles, disturbance, uh, land conversion, biodiversity loss, ozone depletion, and so on. But let's keep on going about CO2 because it's easy enough. So let's recycle the work of one of the uh, PhD uh, of the CET members. So the good thing about gold um, is the size of the data set. It's harder to collect information from other commodities because there are not that many other miners. So 500 commodity, uh, companies produce gold. Uh, on 150 plus mines, 60 report uh, greenhouse emissions, and they mostly publish Scope 1 and Scope 2, not Scope 3, which is a shame. So that's the graph that shows that Australia is definitely not first, while actually we're quite lagging behind in the low 17%. So it's not hard to be least worse than South Africa, which is ranking last, because they're using brown coal to deep three kilometer mines. Um, but at the opposite of the spectrum, you've got that Makassar gold mine here, which has got the lowest uh, greenhouse emissions intensity, 53 kilograms of CO2 per ounce. And so as grades are declining, the emissions are increasing over time. And the underground typically requires higher grade to be economic, and the lower strip ratio means they have a lower CO2 footprint. 
And it doesn't matter for miners because there is a, a carbon risk, a financial and, and value implication. Is um, if you consider investment ESG for pension, sovereign, or for-profit funds, um, there is a potential for green premium. Um, how does the carbon price affect you? Well, it's easier to borrow money if you can prove you won't become a stranded. And so for gold explorer, the rational response is to select and target jurisdiction with clean energy resources for exploration, um, especially when you've got other factors to consider. And so it's most likely going to take place in Finland, Canada and Brazil, not Australia. And because W is an expert country in allowing operation to proceed and then realizing that maybe they need to go into care maintenance, I know what I'm speaking about, um, some of the projects shown here have ceased um, since I did that graph in 2021. And so this is an updated view of the gold landscape with publicly available data. So Boddington here is an anomaly because of the chart and it's getting um, great electricity for five cents and it's called power station. So it's cheaper than most others and it's dirtier too. Um, but basically, if I want to do some name dropping, uh, Gascon Resources, Dacian, Regis, Wiluna, Anglo Australia, Bilabon, all of these are players that um, are bad in carbon intensity. So you should have understood by now that with an infinite quantity of energy, well, you can do about anything. Any granite that becomes a source of aluminium. You could even mine gold from seawater. Historically, we wanted to turn lead into gold. And now we've known that um, with a particle accelerator, all it takes is remove three protons. And actually, it's feasible, not economic, but feasible. Um, and so basically, ask geologists to find any ore at parts per billion or couple of carats per hundred tons. We'll find it as long as we don't have to be behind the. And this shows you what energy enables. So basically, you've got 90 gigajoules of energy. You can get a ton of copper using numbers from uh, Sunfire. If you use Pilgrim Minerals numbers, 36 gigatons, and you get a ton of lithium. You've got energy, you want rare earth, go with Silenas, and then you're going to have some, uh, or you can have a look at IGO's numbers, 31 gigajoules to get a concentrate of nickel, copper, cobalt. Now you want gold. All right, well, you require 10,000 times this amount of energy. Is that a wise use of energy? Maybe, maybe not. If you want diamonds, it's 100 times more than gold. So, and then you can obviously convert all of this energy into CO2, but I leave that for the audience as a trivial exercise. Um, so now that raises the question, were all chips created equal? Is it worth drilling for every commodity or just a few of them, regardless of the actual uh, monetary cost? Or should we focus our efforts and allocate our energy expenses towards metal that are actually relevant? For Breaking news, it takes lead and graphite and sulfuric acid to make regular car batteries. It takes lithium and nickel and graphite and cobalt to make other kind of batteries. And the more recent the technology, the more miniaturized, the more dispersed elements were. You've got two bucks of metal in your smartphone. Are you going to make any profit by dismantling that by hand to scavenge and turn them in the condensators rather than mine some more conibite? And yeah, making the entire US car fleet would cause lithium shortage. Here you've got a comparative analysis of the metal content of two cars. But you don't always need 200 kilograms of critical material if you're driving an e-bike or an e-scooter instead. The annual demand for copper, lithium, nickel calculated here is for the evolution of infrastructure in the reference technology scenario and then the beyond two degrees scenarios from the International Energy Agency. And what you see here is that in a growing, envi growing environment, well, you require more metals. And it's only once you've reached a steady state, like here in some economies, developed economies, you see like the US, Australia, places in Europe, that then you actually are stopping that forever growing growth and stabilizing into this very typical logistic curve or S-shaped uh, consumption per capita over time. And only then recycling will actually be an option because at the moment you need more metal to feed growing population.
So whence do these critical minerals will end up? Right. Number one, great for the electricity distribution. You need copper. Too bad that Sunfire's degrisa mine is exhausted. Number two, wind. With 10 tons of mineral input per megawatt of installed capacity onshore and 15 tons offshore, means that Linus would better keep producing those rare earth in Montwell to get magnets in the turbines. Number three, solar PV. You need a bit of everything, including tellurium that most WA gold mines very rarely. Copper, silicon, silver, tellurium, zinc, among others, that's seven tons per megawatt of installed power capacity you require in solar. That's six times more material than a gas power plant, actually. But is mass balance that reason of a problem? Well, maybe a vote in parliament will fix it. Actually, it won't. So where are these elements going to come from? New mines, bigger holes, more dispersion of naturally occurring geochem anomaly. It's in the net zero emission scenario, we need the lithium to be increased 26 fold, cobalt 6 fold, nickel 12 fold, graphite 9 times. So this basically tells you that the bottleneck um, are these elements, which we will require if we want to meet target by 2040 this time. Choose your horse in this problem stick and get the highest return for the next coming. Calculated and observed numbers for energy production. Um, well, whatever. Um, so the amount of metals we've mined to date since the antiquity is about the same quantity of the metals we'll require in the next 35 years. That's a lot of metals. And um, with a 5% increase on year on year, that means you're doubling every 12 years. But aluminium production was doubled in between 2000 and today. Does that mean that in the next 40 years, we'll be able to quadruple the aluminum production as we need it? Well, and that's where we go back to thermodynamic uh, limits and um, nice graph. So as you know, most distribution of things follow a normal bell-shaped uh, bell curve because the concentration of metal can't be negative, that distribution is skewed, and then is log normal. So instead of being a shape, you've got this sort of shape. Right. So, Alain in 1957, um, that Nobel Prize winner, did that graph, which is another log-log distribution. So this time he's playing with money, but also having a look at the um, metal content in, um, in places. So you see, again, log distribution. So now let's have a look at that. The first term of the energy requirement is a function of the inverse of the concentration. So said otherwise, it's proportional to one over the grade. That is, the, lowest, the lower the metallic con uh, concentration in the ore, the more mass needs to be mined and subsequently crushed. The other terms are constant. ES is the all sorting uh, energy requirement, and then you've got the metallurgy requirements. So overall, one growing and two constant terms, the energy requirement for metal production is increasing over time as we mine lower grade deposits. And this is where the energy mostly goes through, crushing, um, crushing and then to a lower degree, absorption and excavation and at the very bottom. So, we've seen that the price is uh, correlated to the energy of the production, which is inversely correlated to the concentration. And for concentration of ore less than 1%, so think like copper, nickel, those kind of commodities, while well, the energy of separation and metallurgy is significantly uh, less than that of the effect of concentration. So, actually, um, if the price of nickel, copper, and so on increase, um, the concentration is allowed to go further down. But actually, the problem is between 1900 and, and, and 2000, the price, absolute inflation adjusted, actually dropped 2% a year. And that meant we were, um, sorry. But with those depleting grades, that was all right because we were having so much more energy efficiency that it was balancing out. Until 2000, the gain in 
energy efficiency compensated those drops in the grays. Um, and then because of that log number distribution, if you've got falling grades, you've got more surface area, so you actually have more reserves. And so that sum, the quantity of metals and the quantity of reserve since 1900 have actually been both exponential. We've had more metals um, and more reserves at the same time because of those um, log normal distribution. But the distance to the thermodynamic limit has been inversely exponential. And so we are getting closer. If you're considering communities with more than 1% uh, concentration, so think aluminium or iron ore, then that's metallurgy energy requirement, which is the most significant of them all. And so basically, that 1%, um, 1.5% a year efficiency gain won't be able to last forever because there is a thermodynamic limit here that we are reaching or that will be reached by the end of the century, which means that eventually an improvement in mechanical crushing and grinding technologies won't be able to happen as quickly as the drop in concentration of the oil reserves. So that's bad because this ever-increasing energy requirement of lower grade ore, uh, which is that uh, thermal uh, dynamically red line here, ETL, but um, we can never be 100% efficient. So we'll always have to be above that theoretical limit of what could be achieved. And you see that in time, we've actually um, gone into lower grades. We've had energy gain, here, but now we are getting very, very close to that line. And at some point, the trajectory that we are on will have to inflex and go back up again. So we're going to have to have more energy uh, expenses. And as we've seen, most likely more price because we're going to reach that um, energy limit. So what is going to balance out the growth of these critical minerals? Well, most likely the degrowth of coal mining. Um, are we going to be expecting to be better off? Yes, yeah. or the better. So let's go beyond Kaya's equation and start this identity with another tautology, that is that the metal is strictly a coal coal cell and so is an So consider a metal-free wooden pan, which is enough to collect some gold powered by a metal-free human. So you pan, you pan, you pan, and you end up with a net positive metal gain on this job, but that ain't much. So you upgrade to a metallic spade and shovel and a sieve and maybe some mercury, and then the rest is still human labor. And then you up your game again with a piece of technology called a metal detector made of metal with coils and batteries, and then you trade your horse for a 4x4 not to carry your gear, but because you want to enforce your social status and while finding some more yellow metal. And then you buy a dredge and pumps and a shaking table and everything is electric electricity powered. So how metal intensive is this gold gonna be? Any metal is just some energy spent and that energy being itself more or less metal intensive. Like in Minecraft, mankind started with some wooden stone tools and later developed increasing and that's what you can see here, the energy requirements of the different metals, which actually follows a very straight correlation with how diluted they are naturally occurring in the crust. And then that's why you can actually see that direct relationship between the price they have and the dilution. So the amount of raw material per megawatt uh, required for a range of production facilities, concrete, steel, aluminium, copper. And then you can see that energy has a massive materiality, but most of the time, nuclear is the big winner in terms of energy, uh, the metallic requirement. This is how much metal you need in kilogram per megawatt of different energy generation solutions. While the fossil power station requires little metal, the next least metal intensive power plant is nuclear, and these metals mined with fossil fuels can be used to generate renewable power used in the mine site to extract more metals. But does all of these together? Well, by the time you realize you need a fair bit of the periodic table of elements 
just for those shiny nuggets of plain gold. And it's an even greater reliance that if you take that to the industrial stage. So mankind is trying hard to locally increase the metallic content of energy because it's more comfortable to have fossil fuel and electron thirsty machine built with metals to do the job for us. Yet, we subsequently depleted stock of locally enriched geological anomalies, which means we are spending an ever increasing amount of energy for metal yield, which is not catching up. If we want the system to remain at equilibrium within the physical boundaries and constraint of the planet, this identity can't drift away from one in the long run. Regardless of how energy intensive the process is, it is a wise, is it a wise allocation of resources to lock so much lithium, nickel, copper, rare earth and so on for the mining of gold? Or should these metals better be used in prospecting and mining for the commodities of tomorrow relevant to the global energy transition challenge? This is, in my opinion, when it means to respect the planetary limits while being in line with a, uh, a long-term net zero goal. Thank you very much. Question? Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a feel, but because 
the oceans of the world create the most energy? Do you think that in the future there are going to be people that will be able to really have harness the ocean's energies in a way that I will not be able to perceive? To harness energy, you need a gradient. Right? So the easiest uh, gradient is the waves. Uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. Um, oh, sorry. The, oh. Uh, not the wave, the. Um, Tide. Yeah, the tide there. Thanks. The tides. You only have like three uh, tide places. One in France and the other in Korea. I will talk about the third one because you've got like 13 meters variance. What's the variance here in Australia? Well, the King Sound is about 12 meters, so you could do it at King Sound. Yeah, but that's that's not the whole coastline. And then the other problem is like, well, people like to live around the coastline, and then you need like a river to concentrate that energy so that it's actually the river against the ocean and whatever. So it's very minimal basis. The waves themselves uh, do harness some energy, but then it's, it's sort of what's the metallic or materialistic requirement you have to harness this energy. What do you want energy for? And then, um, yeah, you need more energy of all. Um, is that substitution or is just topping up on top of everything already pre-existing? And, um, and then the other thing is, the energy from the ocean is just derived solar energy in the first place, same with wind. And so maybe you're better off capturing that and depleted body system, photons of protein depleted but solar energy in the first place. Um, yeah. I see more the ocean as a fixed for agriculture, where you can displace some of the agricultural requirements from the land, but that competition of use where maybe you want to be the car park, maybe you want to leave the forest as it is, or maybe you want actually fields or be the uni. Um, and then if you can shift agricultural production by algae or like something else in the ocean, or you've got less competition around here. Alright, thanks for that. So um, we still have the question here. So actually we have in the John Global Room just upstairs uh, SCG student chapter of organized drinks, so we can convene there uh, uh, some drinks like we just asked for call con donation because it helps with the activities and, and, and we can continue to discuss there. If you have more questions, Nicolas, we, we, we can do that there. We bring these laptops, so um, yeah, I invite you to convene over there and just join me for one last time to thank Nicolas for his talk again.